you know, in the old days, they would take the boys out of the village, out of the comfort of their mother's arms, snap them into the frigid cold of the Northlands or into the bush of Africa and hand them a spear and say, go kill a lion. Don't come back till either you're dead or the lion's dead. We've lost that in our kind of Western industrialized country. And um, there's something about that that I think is the very solution to where we find ourselves as a culture today of, of really having a path and some experiences for our boys to know what they're stepping into. What does it mean to be a good man in this world and to um, put them into some discomfort so they really can experience that in a deep way. What is up, my friends? Welcome to Fatherhood Field Notes podcast, where I interview incredible fathers, gaining wisdom from their stories for you and I to grow in our craft. I'm your guide, Ned Shout, father to five kiddos, currently ages 10 to 17, and husband to my rad wife, Sarah, working on our 20th year of marriage. So yep, I'm in the thick of it, and I am working daily to rebel against the low expectations for fathers and create a world where fathers know who they are as they show up for their families. You and I have the greatest opportunity to impact our world through the way we embrace our fatherhood role. This episode is brought to you by The Adventure of Fatherhood, helping men discover their powerful fatherhood role and build their fatherhood skills. The role of the father is to serve, guide, provide, protect, and of course, find joy and have fun in the messiness of it all. Today's guest is my friend Luke Entrup, and we talk about teaching your son to be a powerful man emotionally and dot, 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 whatever that means to you. Key components of building out a rite of passage for your child and not outsourcing your parenting. Enjoy meeting my friend, Luke. Friends, what's happening? I'm stoked to be talking fatherhood with my new friend, Luke. Luke, what's happening? How are you today? I'm excellent. Thanks for having me on the show. Love what you're up to. Love the show. So yeah, thrilled to be here, man. Love it, dude. Yeah. Anytime to talk fatherhood with another dude who is passionate about it, cares about it, and is is authentic and vulnerable about it uh, gets me stoked because that's where, you know, my hope is that all of us dads will be because I, I always say this, but at the end of the day, like my kids could marry your kids one day. So I could be the best dad and striving to be the best dad in the world. But if I'm not there walking with standing with other dads, uh, there's not a big hope in future for my own kids, right? So we got to stick together and, and help each other as we're all in this together. Yeah, here, here. I mean, so much of what I do is for them, right? And not to mention, I mean, I think about the things that have made me grow the most as a human and this ranks right at the top of the list, right? Being in relationship and raising kids, it's quite an opportunity to kind of become a better version of my, my of myself. Yeah, always becoming. So let's kick it off with this. How old do you find yourself today? Oh, exactly where I am. I'm 45. Yeah, 45 years old. Exactly where I am. What do you mean by that? Oh, I, you know, this idea that uh, maybe I should feel younger or older, and then hmm. somehow there's value based on uh, feeling younger or older than I actually am. But I am, I squarely feel 45 and quite happy about it. Mm, I love that answer. How many years you've been married? I am, I am divorced. I am divorced. So I was married for, uh, eight years and we co-parent now we have a peaceful co-parent relationship. That's been six years now. And let me tell you, like so much work went into making that a good, a good, um, peaceful, harmonious, you know, relationship for our children and feel really good about it at this point. So let me just pause real quick. Do you want me to just cut that out? I'm fine with it either way, but I just like asked the question so abruptly. I don't care. No, it doesn't matter to me. You can cut it if you need to. It's whatever you feel. It I doesn't matter to me if you are or not, but I just don't want it to be like, oh, I'm divorced and that feel anything other than what it is. It's good. It's good. You can ask it again if you want. Otherwise, I'm, I'm fine leaving it in. I actually work with uh, guys on divorce and recovering from yeah, divorce. Yeah, I mean, I think that's important. I think it's important to bring up. So let's just bring it up at another point point. Got it. How many kiddos do you have? I have two. I have a son, Julian, who's 12 and Amara, my daughter, she's almost 10. Oh, love it. Yeah. Love it. So yeah. one of each. Okay. So 10 and 12. <clears throat> now, where do you reside as a family? And with that, what is it that you do for a living to provide value in the world? Mm, love that question. So yeah, we, we live in Sonoma County. So um, I I live uh, 20 minutes from their mom. So we are okay. peacefully divorced and we live in, in two homes. So I, I'm a full-time parent 
half the time. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is, you know, yeah, no. there, it's, it's a quite an intense journey at times. And, um, I wouldn't have it any other way. Any advice you would give, right? So you said peaceful, you live close to mom, but also it's like, I'm full time, half time, you know, before we just kind of keep cruising here with that nugget there. Yeah. So many of us in our day and age are kind of going through that, entering into that, finding ourselves into that. What are a couple things you would share with the dudes who are listening that would be helpful for them if they are entering into that season? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's such an important question, right? Because there's so many opportunities to really kind of get our kids all twisted through a big breakup and a divorce, right? And and not to mention, mm-hmm. it's just really, I mean, it was going through that myself was the most painful couple of years of my life. But, you know, a couple of things I think are super important about it. One is I was very clear I had done everything I could do to try to save the marriage. And so was she. And we decided, yeah. we, we realized like we just could no longer meet each other's needs. And it was very clear. But we spent a solid two years and really the last year very intensely just making sure trying everything. We called in all the mm-hmm. help we could get. We got went to every therapist and coach and retreat and workshop and just really tried to make it work. And then it became clear, yeah, this isn't working. So that's super important to make sure like we've left nothing there's nothing left to do. And then... Right, you know, so you're never looking back, right? You're never looking back, well, what if I could have or whatever? And then your kids also see that, hey, we're, we're, we're doing the very... We're doing everything we can for this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not... I wouldn't say it's that I never look back. Of course, like, I always wonder what could have been. Mm. But, but, you know, I've really... I feel like I could always put my head on the pillow at night and say, like, I really tried and so did she. And it just, it, we had just grown so far apart that it was very clear that our family needed to shift. And then from there, just the other principle that I think is really important, both of us have put our kids at the center of our relationship. So everything we have done around cleaning up all of our past resentments and hurt and pain and, and that kind of like that toxicity that was in that relationship we really, we took a little bit of time apart and then we really worked on cleaning that up um, so that we could be good co-parents. We were no longer spouses. We were no longer each other's partners, but we will always be co-parents. So we we had some very difficult, very complicated conversations so that we could really reach that deeper level of harmony. And that was all for them. It was all for the kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's just important, putting the kids at the center, even if it means like doing painful and uncomfortable things. And, you know, um, that that's just been a guiding principle for both of us. Yeah. So really taking what what would tend, or I'm sure the default would want to be very selfish to take that out as much as possible for the sake of the kids, you know, to not bash on the other exactly. or to make it difficult for the kids to try to, whose side do I have to be on? Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, if you're going to make that decision to really step to the side and, and create space for them to feel peace. Yeah. It's beautiful. And there's a very specific thing that we've done now for six years, which is once a month, we schedule an hour. Sometimes it takes a little longer and we just uh, clear out issues that we've had. Mm. It's, it's a, it's a, a monthly clearing where we, and sometimes it takes literally takes like five minutes and then we talk about the kids the rest of the time, but we make sure that we get together and we speak the truth that needs to be spoken. We have a structure that we use that we follow a very clear kind of communication structure around how we do that. But that's made all the difference in the world because it doesn't, the kind of residue doesn't build up between us, right? And just keeping the keeping that um, clear about the ways that we're co-parenting, that we're on the same page. And if we inevitably, we're going to rub the other person the wrong way, right? Like there's a reason why we're no longer married, but just to keep clearing that out as often as we can. Yeah. So two questions or a question and a thought <clears throat> is, is there somebody that helps if, if, if there's like, Hey, this, there's just zero way we can unpack this together. Is there someone that you have said, Hey, we would bring this person in to help with this conversation or is that not something that's been necessary? Yeah. We had to do that a couple of times very early on. And we brought in a, like a family therapist basically that Mm. helped facilitate Mm. that conversation. It was very brief. It was, you know, one or two sessions. It actually was my son's therapist. It was somebody that already, already knew because some of the issues were around how we were parenting him. Right. And uh, we had to, different points of view about it. And um, we brought in him and he just facilitated a bit of a like, 
listening session between us. And that really helped. And we were, you know, we haven't needed much of that in the years that have followed. But I, I, yeah, I interesting. think I, some people, you know, I early on, I think it's wise to get some help, especially around the structure of how you have those conversations. Yeah. And I think, I mean, just even how you said it, a listening session, I think is so critical because when a third person's in the room, it's probably going to make me be less of a prick, mm-hmm. right? Or, or less of a child. Um, I'm going to show up a little bit more um, with not, not in a tantrum. And then the, the thought I had around that is I didn't really think about it till you said it, but even dudes who are married, if you're listening to this, how much peace would that create in your home? If once a month you sat down with your wife and you're like, Hey, anything we need to just kind of unload from the last month. So it's not in a fight. Cause usually it's like all that crap comes up in the fight. We're like, Oh, well, last week you did this. Um, and my wife and I, we have a, uh, uh we call it our kingdom meeting every two weeks, mm-hmm. roughly, you know, mm-hmm. cause crap comes up with the kids. But one of the questions in our thing is like, is there anything you need from me? Is there anything I need from you? Is there anything that's that I've been doing that's been bothering you or whatever. So it's kind of like same thing, right? But in all of our relationships, it would be great to create that space to like let go of anything that you might maybe be holding on to. Yeah. I mean, this is the big thing that I took from that, from my marriage ending that I am so committed to in all my, you know, my relationship moving forward. My, you know, is that with my partner now is that I am so committed to clearing up resentment and misunderstanding and conflict as close to when it happens as possible. Because I do think that that was part of what led to my, my marriage crumbling and you're spot on. Like the marriages that do this, the relationships that do this, they have such a better chance of thriving and, and being, you know, these kind of energizing places for us rather than a place of resentment and draining our energy. So absolutely endorse that. Yeah. And just a great question, just in general, when you say that, for us to pause relationship, work, whatever. Hey guys, what's draining your energy right now? Mm -hmm. Like if you can start to look at, Hey, what's draining your energy, whether it is a relationship or something that's going on and pinpoint that and then go take some action around that. Um, or at least voice it and bring it out into the light. I don't think we paused enough to go, why am I so stressed right now? Why am I so tired right now? Why am I feeling so heavy right now? If I could go pin, because then everything seems to feel heavy, right? When in the reality, it might just be like one thing that's kind of weighing me down, um, pinpointing that. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, there's this whole idea, you know, when we think about like being effective in our work in the world, there's this idea of like time management, but they've actually done some Mm. studies around this. And it's for most people, it's less about time management and more about energy management that drains us. It's not where we're spending more time. It's not how much time we're spending on something. It's what we're actually doing. I think you're, you're right. Like we need to be very careful about, um, sometimes we have to do things that we don't want to do, but if we're really getting drained, that's a sign that like, maybe we're not, we're not, we're not operating in the right direction or the right altitude strategies off. Right. Yeah. So I asked where you live, but I don't know. I I then asked also, what is it? What what is it that you do to provide value in the world? Yeah. And I don't think we got into that. (laughs) We skipped ahead. So I'm a men's coach and a leadership coach. Um, I coach men around relationships. I lead rites of passage programs to help boys become men. Um, and yeah, and then I coach leaders of companies. So I work mostly with men and, and, uh, my, my real passion though, is this work around rites of passage, helping, uh, boys make the transition into healthy, uh, manhood. And what made that important to you? Oh man, I'll tell you, it actually goes back to my own story. If we go back in time, like when I was, you know, when I was a young guy, I was, I was an actor and I loved being an actor. I was on stage all the time doing a bunch of stuff, modeling and all the the fun things. And, um, and then at some point when I was 19, that was just like, it just wasn't the thing to do anymore. They like the, as you said, like the energy just kind of drained out of it and it, I was not enjoying it. And I was in a period of just feeling really lost in my life and spent several years kind of out in the desert, just in the flatlands, not a lot of direction. And my dad invited me when I was 22 years old to a men's retreat. And Mm. um, on this retreat, basically, I mean, just to cut to the end of this story, like I went in a boy and I came out a man and it was so clear to me. I was 22 years old. I was surrounded by 80 dudes who were like on fire with their life. You could like just this fierce presence in them. They knew 
all about what it meant to be a man that was both you know, kind of connected to his own power and was living with an open heart. And they were so curious about me and really kind of took me under their wings and mentored me around these ways of like living a life of passion and service to your community and living for something greater than yourself. And it profoundly changed my life. And that is, you know, this is a rite of passage, right? Having an experience of getting snapped out of your everyday reality and shown a new way of being and being surrounded by uh, mentors and elders that can initiate you into a new way of being. And, you know, in the old days, this happened, like they would take the boys yeah. out of the village, out of the comfort of their mother's arms, snap them into the frigid cold of the <laughs> Northlands or into the bush of Africa and hand them a spear and say, go kill a lion. Don't come back till either you're dead or the lion's dead, you know, and, and there's uh, something about that, that has, we've, we've lost that in our kind of Western industrialized country. And, um, there's something about that that I think is the very solution to where we find ourselves as a culture today of of really having a path and some experiences for our boys to know what they're stepping into. What does it mean to be a good man in this world and to um, put them into some discomfort so they really can experience that in a deep way? Now, why? I know looking like you have an event coming up. <clears throat> and so I, I was taking a look at your father son event. Mm -hmm. um, why 10 to 14 versus, you know, your experience was at 22? Yeah, it's a great question. So there, those that have really looked at these developmental inflection points, um, there's two major ones, uh, you know, after birth, essentially, right? And the first one is the passage from early childhood into adolescence, and that's 10 to 14. Mm -hmm. That is the time when they, uh, the sense of belonging, being part of like a tribe or, you know, a band or a sports team, this sense of belonging yeah. is really important. But this is not actually the passage. The second one is the passage into adulthood, adolescence into adulthood. So there's kind of two inflection points, right? Um, the first one, which is what I'm working on, it's very much also about establishing a connection to you know their parent, in this case, the boys with a really good, deep connection with their fathers or their father figures so that their father is someone they can turn to um, as those tumultuous teenage years take hold. It's also the time, I don't know about you, but like for me personally, you know, my, I had this idea for this program when I, my son was about nine or 10, I could feel him just starting to slip away, right? It's like my baby mm. is starting to slip away. He's starting to like, I don't feel him in the same way. He's not as open with me. And, and that's normal and necessary yeah. and important. And, um, I just want to make sure I'm doing everything I can to have a nice, solid, deep bond with him. And so that's really what this experience is about. We do a lot of, you know, time in the woods with fathers and sons walking together and time around the fire. And it's kind of a, a community uh, retreat. The second rite of passage is the one into manhood. And that's from 17 to 20, sometimes 16 to 20, they'll say. And that's classically when you know, the boys were, again, stripped out of the arms of their mothers and like taken into the to the bush for the, you know, some sort of hero's journey where they'd have to face some danger either in the world or in their own heart and mind and then come back, mm. come back an initiated man. And they knew exactly what that meant. Now I know what it means to be a good man. And that comes a little later. Um, so both are important. I just, my work is focused primarily on the the first inflection point childhood into adolescence yeah love it now in this first inflection point <clears throat> the the childhood what, what would you say are like the you know two to five nuggets or, or you know like the the things that you definitely try to hit on you know if a father's trying to think through plan through doing something with their kid. Obviously there's different events they could go to, mm -hmm. but if they were to plan something, what are the, some of the things that you want the son and the father walking away with from an experience together? Yeah. Great question. So we, the first thing is to take them out of the comforts of their everyday reality and go into something right. that's immersed in nature, ideally, because nature becomes its own character then, right? There's an opportunity for discomfort. There's an opportunity for wonderment and awe. There's an opportunity for a down regulation of the nervous system so you can get into some deeper states and mm -hmm. have real conversations. So that's the first thing is get outside. Um, the second thing is that it should have some element of, of like what we call training. We call it uh, training 
on the path of warriorship. So there's some sort of a uh, physical component. We do some light martial arts, some yoga. The boys jump in cold water with their dads if they want to. It's you know, so we do cold exposure, and it's about facing the things that we don't want to do and doing it anyway. Um, yep. So there's like a the whole thing about that piece, right? Um, so it should be hard at times. The third piece would be uh, we do a lot around emotional awareness. So we we really you know, and I think this is like a great offering that any father can bring to his son is helping him understand, you know, what it means to have one eye out in the world, navigating how I'm mo- mm. moving through the world and one eye into my own heart and my own mind. I, you know, and Good. this is like a, 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 you know, this is power. This is power. This is what it means to be a powerful man that I, I can track when I'm feeling angry or um, turned on or sad or afraid and I know what that means and I know what to do with it. I know how to express it. And I also can read it in other people, right? So um, the way we define power is that I have the power to get stuff done in the world, but I also have the power to face my own heart and mind. And that allows me to, you know, be more influential in the world, essentially. Um, and then the last piece is just, you know, mm. it's very, it's very, um, well, actually, I'd say two more pieces. One is we do a whole thing around consent, changing bodies, puberty, sex, so that the boys get some just practical information about that and have some conversations with their dads about that. We open up the possibility for those nice. conversations to happen. We bring in a sex educator who kind of works through that with them. And then the final component is ceremony and ritual. So in the last mm. night, everybody's around a fire. And we do a ceremony where they get a gift and they're honored and they, it's very clear to them, you're now on the path of warrior sh- of warriorhood. Uh, you're on the path of, of becoming a teenager or being a teenager. And it's, you were in early childhood. Now you're in the path to, to um, your adolescence. And there's something about that demarcation that hits pretty deep in the human soul, right? And we see this when the boys leave, there's a sense of feeling more settled in themselves, desire for more Mm. independence, feeling a bit more secure, feeling a bit more um, connected to themselves, and ideally to their fathers, right? So those are some of the the main ingredients, right? Yeah. Okay. So a couple of things I really love is, is one, obviously you're opening up this conversation now between a father and son. So the hope is that it's not an end all be all in that moment, but it's a realization of the relationship that can be because now we've opened up to be able to talk about harder things, deeper things, um, more, you know, et cetera. The other thing is I really love your language around. We're not acknowledging that this morning you were a boy and now after this fire, you're a, you're a teenager, but you are on the path to, because I think sometimes when we, we, we have these like marker moments that are supposed to feel like a, like a wedding's a great example. Mm -hmm. An hour ago, I wasn't married. Now I'm married. There's like a clear, like this moment happened. Whereas these other moments of, am I a man? Am I a teenager? And I mean, obviously if I turn 12 to 13, like, okay, I'm a teenager based on my age, but I love the concept of path because it's, it's, it, it gives some freedom in, there are going to be moments where I act like a kid. There are going to be moments where I act like a teenager, not one's right or wrong. It's just, I'm on this path of becoming. Um, so I, I love that. And then the other word you said, which I think is so powerful is that as men, we have influence in our world positive or negative. If I'm sitting on my parents' couch at 30 years old doing nothing, like my influence, I'm missing the power of my influence in the world because nobody invited me in to show me my power, Mm -hmm. right? That power of one eye looking out, one eye looking in. Uh, And and at the end of the day, that fulfillment as a man is that I made a mark on this world, Mm -hmm. right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, I think it is It is taught, right? Like this idea of personal power is something that can be cultivated and, and kind of harnessed, right? And part of it is, you know, it's power. It's not power over. It's not power right. over others. It's having the power to influence and make an impact, as you say, um, to push our purpose into the world. And of course, at 12, we don't know what our purpose is yet. 
but we but we can be connected to a sense of um, feeling alive in ourselves and surround getting being surrounded by people that really give us good advice. Um, the other piece I'll say about power that we often talk about is um, there's a power in sensitivity, right? Like there's there's mm. the assertive power out in the world, but there's also a power to really understand my influence on other people, how I'm impacting them with my words, my actions, my deeds, my how I share my emotions, that that actually sensitivity is, um, you know, in, in olden times maybe was seen as weakness, but we actually realize now sensitivity, being aware of what's happening in me and others actually makes me more effective in the world. So it's actually a superpower to be you, know, you might say a sensitive man, not in the classic sense of weak, but in the sense of I am tracking how I'm showing up around other people. And that helps me get things done in the world. Yeah, I, I, I think the idea of either sensitivity or vulnerability, probably a bunch of other words we could use, but am I strong enough to open myself up to you? Right? So <clears throat> most, not most, there's this idea that men are supposed to not cry and be strong, but in many in, in in many aspects, the strongest thing to do would be to like I think like the best example I could think of is like Jesus on the cross. Hmm. Like he has all the power to do anything he wants based on what you believe about the story, right? So if he's on the if he's God and he's on the cross, he has all the power to just make this all stop, whatever but he leans into not doing that, right? Like, and that's true power is knowing you have the ability to do something and, and, and doing what's best for the moment. Right. Yeah. And that's being vulnerable and open because that's an inward look at who do I need to be in this situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, I mean, yeah. What a vivid example of that. Right. And, you know, I think that there's a difference between, being sensitive and collapsing, right? Like there's a way in which we can, we can still have our vulnerable feelings and lean into that as men, mm. but still show up and do the hard thing anyway. I mean, they uh, agree. You know, yeah. Like I, the, one of the times this happened for me was he, he, so my boy is really into racing and he, um, was in a really important go-kart race and the car stalled out on the start and he was just crushed because he just had so mm. much that he, he was so much of his identity and yeah. everything was wrapped up in that. And it was a mechanical issue. And he, you know, he basically was really bummed out and was, you know, kind of crying when he got out of the car and was like, I need to leave right now. And I took him outside and I said, we're, you know, this is totally, you know, you're feeling exactly what you need to feel right now. And, we're going to go back inside and we're going to cheer on your buddies who made it on the podium. Mm -hmm. He wanted to just go home. Right. And yeah. so I was with him. I was like, man, that's, that's a great example. I, I, this sucks. I'm so sorry, man. This is yeah. like, this is part of the deal and it just hurts. I know how much this hurts for you. How you were, you know, you were qualified really high. You had all the chance in the world to win this race. And yeah, this happened and this is terrible. And, you know, we're going to go, you don't even need to wipe tears out of your eyes. We're going to go back inside. We're going to cheer on your friends and then we're going to go home. It's like feeling it and then doing the thing anyway, rather than feeling it and collapsing. Uh, it's so powerful for us dads to hear that because in that moment, a lot of times we and or mom wants to, you, this sucks. It was not fair. It was not right. Yes, yes, you're a victim, right? This happened. But you have a choice at this point to see yourself as a victim and like, this sucks. What a joke. You should have won. Let's go home and let's on the way, let's get an ice cream. Like we try to, and, and we're creating, I mean, how horrible to do that versus, and now the flip side too is wipe off those tears. Don't feel like that. We don't show up like this. Don't let anybody let you cr see you cry. We're going inside. Those are two kind of extremes mm -hmm. to the moment at hand, but for you to go, Hey dude, this is a bummer. This did happen, but now what mm -hmm. let's go in, let's cheer. This is, this is how we show up. Mm -hmm. So I think the way that you had your kid show up in that moment is just like, Oh man, life skills, big time right there. Yeah. Hard earned life skills, man. <laughs> Hard earned on, on both our parts. You know, it's like, it's uh that's not the, but also, yeah. yeah, but also like, I mean, in the big scheme of things, your goat cart 
you know, dying out before the race. If you can operate in that manner and that, think about when some really big things happen during your life. Mm -hmm. You know, you've cultivated a way that you show up to experiences. The meaning you place on an experience um, is going to just help you when those really, truly big things happen that make a lot of people spiral out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it's like it's back to this this other point where I hope when things get hard, I'm positioning myself as the father to be one of the people that they can turn to. I don't need to be there. I don't need to be there. Everything. I won't be. Yeah. They need other good adults in their life. But um, I'm hoping in moments like that, I'm establishing a connection with my son where he will feel comfortable to continue to turn to me when things continue to get more difficult and more intense as he heads through his teenage years. Yeah. And you know, you know what you did that I think is cultivating that is you didn't make the moment about you. Mm hmm right? You didn't make it about you. <clears throat> when we turn to being selfish and like, how does this make me look as a dad? Like, oh, I feel dumb. Like the dads are going to think I don't know how to fix my call, my go cart, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. All the lies we can say to ourselves, you didn't make it about you. When we make it about us, our kids can feel that. And so we're not going to be safe for them to express themselves to. Um, Luke, I want to ask you a question. You know, you got a 10 and a 12 year old. When did you embrace fatherhood? You know, so there's the moment you hear you're going to be a dad and then you see your baby born and it's like, whoa, that's one of the most gnarly things ever. And then there's all these little things that happen and, and now you have a 10 and 12 year old. What moment along that journey did you go, fatherhood matters so much. I'm all in on this. Hmm. What a great question. You know, I um, honestly, there were two moments that it, it's been like a like a journey of deepening for me. I don't think there, mm -hmm. there wasn't like a, a light switch for me, but the first one was, this is a little bit of a wacky story. I don't know that I've told this on a podcast before, but um, like three years before my son was born, I was down in Peru in the Amazon doing an ayahuasca plant medicine journey, which is like a psychedelic um, where you go mm -hmm. on a, like a healing psychedelic journey. And this basically, this is a bit wacky, but like this, just this big light thing just plopped down in front of me for the entire night. Mm. And it was just like looking at a million suns, uh, like a million stars. Right. And it was like talking to me and I'm talking back to it. And I, I realize it's my unborn son. <laughs> and, um, my, uh, girlfriend at the time who is Julian's mother was on a plane coming to meet me in Peru the next day. And, Wild. and I just had this full on conversation with him, his spirit. And I, you know, my message was like, I am so happy to meet you. I am not ready for you yet. I will be ready for you soon. Um, I feel you. I now feel super connected to you. And I, we have to wait. <laughs> and that was when it, that was the moment where I was like, oh, Wild. I am going to be a father. Like I'm going to yeah. be a father. Yeah. This is happening. And, you know, a couple of years later, it happened or... I guess maybe, yeah, like four years later, it happened. Um, the second um, the second time was through the divorce, actually, where this really deepened for mm -hmm. me when I realized being a full-time parent half the time required that I show up in all these areas in their life that I had not shown up for before. Uh, I was making, I make all their foods, half the, all their meals half the time. Right, I help them right. work through oh, social yeah. challenges and... I help them bathe all the stuff that their mother was doing, um, you know, help them meet new friends and work through challenges with friends they have and the stuff that I had not even realized I had outsourced um, being Oof. around them a hundred percent of the time for a week at a time, every other week made me such a better father because I am so much more present in their lives. I can't check out with them because there's nobody else there. And so um, that's when I realized like it was a bit of a surrender. I'm not going to say it was like this joyous process where I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a father. It's more like this is my sadhana. This is my path. This life is to, if I can do this well, then life, I can feel, I can feel good about the way that my life is happening. If I, if I phone this in now um, and I'm half present with my kids in this way, then I, I'm, that will eat at me all my days. And so, you know, that's when I really embraced fatherhood in a very deep way is when I've had to be everything to them half the time. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Luke, this is an, an enormous aha. And I think dad's listening right now. Think about this. Are you outsourcing some of your parenting right now because you're married and you're justifying it that mom's taking care of this, that, or the other? So you're kind of cruising right now. I get it. I think a lot of men fall into this. Like, how is the woman going to have the baby? She decides. How is the baby going to get fed? She decides. Uh, What kind of diapers are we going to use? She decides, right? When this whole thing happens, mom decides so much that I think sometimes dads just default to provider protector, which really just means work, right? Just Mm -hmm. work and lock the door. Uh, And so it can happen that mom decides the preschool, mom decides kindergarten, mom decides, and before you know it, you could wake up and your kids 13, 14, 15, 16, and and you actually didn't make any major decisions. I mean, I remember growing up most of the time, it was just, we asked our mom for everything, right? We didn't ask dad. And so my question is, dads, are you outsourcing? And if you are, even if you're married in your own home, if you are Two people are, three people are greatly missing out. One, your kid's missing out from your perspective, right? Because the kid needs that masculine perspective. Two, you're missing out because that little human is half of you. They need you. There's going to be a fulfillment in that. And then damn sure mom's missing out too because she's carrying your freaking weight. Could be. And so Luke, you found yourself in this situation where you are all those things for, for half, you know, half the time. And what a beautiful part of your story to get to share with other men, to not miss the opportunity to make the breakfast, to connect with them in all those ways that a lot of times, you know, we may, mom may be the one doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And it just feels, I mean, you know, my experience around it is just that it feels like there's more breadth in my relationship. There's a wider spectrum in my relationship with my children. Um, I understand them in a deeper way. It's required a lot more curiosity and kind of um, patience and examination around their world and what's important to them and what they're going through than I had before. I really have had to um, do a lot more listening and poking around at, you know, what's happening in their universe. What kind of foods do they like? Who are their friends? You know, like really Mm. get in there deep. Um, so that I can support them in the best way I can. I, I love, I love that. So with that, <clears throat> what have you learned about yourself and being a father? Man, there is this gap between the father that I dreamed I would be and the father I actually am. Hmm. And the gap is, it's always there and I'm always trying to close it. Like I think part of the experience of being a parent is like (laughs) not to be too kind of like, I don't know, dark about it or, or um, negative, but I do think there's a very common experience about for most of us that want to do it well, where we have an ideal about what, how we think will show up and then how we actually show up. And, you know, what I've learned about fatherhood is to really pay attention to the moments when I feel that tension of me not showing up in the way that I dreamed that I would. And that that Mm. actually is a reflection of my own internal landscape and my own capacity and my own ability to, to go deep and my own ability to, um, just be more grounded and strong. And when I turn away from that discomfort and I just kind of let things go, it, there's this subtle way that it eats at you. Right. And so for me, yeah. like this has been like, I have to be doing my daily practices. I have to, for me, that means like I'm meditating every morning. I'm doing, you know, for me, it's doing some yoga. I have to be walking alone in the woods three or four times a week for a half an hour or an hour. If I don't do that, it, you know, I can't show up in the way that I, I need to show up. And that gap just kind of eats away at me. Yeah. <clears throat> this past year, I read Dan Sullivan's book, The Gap and the Gain. Mm. And that helped me so much, right? Is like learning to celebrate the wins because it's so easy to look at the faults mm-hmm. or not even the faults, but the like the who I know I could be or that I'm working towards or moving towards. And if I compare myself to Ned 10 years ago, I mean, leaps and bounds, but I've also m- had a hundred conversations with a bunch of Lukes, mm-hmm. right? So I'm like, oh, and this, and this, and this. So this ideal version of what it means to be a dad is like this ever growing, like never attainable <laughs> guy. Uh, so I got to, you know, celebrate the wins, um, yeah, which, yeah. 
got got to do regularly. Now, let me ask this because I, you know, I'm leaning more into um, creating some quiet time for myself. Why? What is it that happens during a meditation or quiet time that is helpful for you in, let's say, work mode, dad mode? Because I know it's not just, I just need to do nothing, right? I mean, nothing's happening, but something's happening. So if you were to explain that to somebody, what would you say it is? And then what's a way that somebody could start and kind of get into that, whether it's like, you know, a a meditation app or something like that? What's a useful tool? Yeah. I mean, for me, I've been meditating for 20 plus years and um, it's a daily practice for me. Um, What it's, so it's changed over time. But if I think back about when I first started, um, there's something about, first of all, being able to see my life more clearly when I have a settled mind the mind is constantly mm-hmm. producing thoughts and feelings and anxieties, and it oftentimes can run the show. So if I can take 20, 30, 45 minutes a day and just be in some practices that still the mind and allow there to be a sense of openness and spaciousness, I see all sorts of opportunities and possibilities. And I see the truth of my life and my kids' lives and my work and my clients, the men that I support. I see things more clearly. And there's a there's a thing about it's kind of the Viktor Frankl thing when we're when we've slowed down enough that there's a gap that can build between a stimulus and a response right the difference between mm. reactivity something happens and I immediately react out of habit a thought comes up a feeling comes up um, my behavior just kicks in I don't even think about it with meditation we begin to like wedge a gap between something happening And rather than my reaction, my response. So I can then choose in a moment whether I act out of anger or act out of habit. I can make a choice to show up a little differently. And with meditation, for me, that's really it. I mean, one way to say it is I meditate so I'm not such an (laughs) a-hole. Yeah, yeah. That's the simpler way of putting it. Um, I like it. Yeah. And then what... So let me ask you a question. Yeah. Go go ahead. I was going to say, yeah. And then what, what do you do with it? There's a ton of great apps. I like Calm. Um, Yeah. The... I, one of the best meditations for people to start with is something called box breathing. Just hop on YouTube and, and you know, search box breathing. It's a, ca- it's a mm. counted breath. Um, put your hand on your belly and just, it's just about, it, you're essentially just training the mind by focusing on the breath. And it's like any other training, like going to the gym. At first, it's a little hard. And then after a week or two, you start to see some results. And then after a month, you're like, oh, this is actually really changing the way I think. And after six months, you're a different human. Um, but a good place to start is box breathing, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I really like, um, I haven't been using it lately, but Sam Harris is, uh, waking up app His I just, the dude's voice too. I just freaking love it. It's a great one. Um, one question I had for you. Okay. So if I'm meditating, I just want to ask your thoughts on this. You said, seeing the truth in my life or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, Cause our mind could be going so much. And I, I, I like just the other night we're having a conversation with one of our daughters and she's, fe- you know, feeling some heavy feelings and, and, and whatnot. And so me and my wife had a great 45 minute conversation with her and we're like, Hey, we know when you get into bed, some of these thoughts are going to come up like, Oh, my parents actually don't care about this. They were just appeasing me. Right. So you got to pause and then go, hang on. What's true. Mm-hmm. We shut off a movie. All the other kids left the room. I mean, there's some facts around what's true, Mm -hmm. right? And and we spent the 45 minutes, we were listening, we were engaged, you weren't on our phones, right? There's all these little facts that make it true. So so two questions or two parts of this. When you think about the truth of your life, right? It's it's looking at the facts, but then it's also putting the meaning on it, right? Like I get to choose to say, my my dad wasn't on the phone while we were talking. Like he didn't, for 45 minutes, he didn't check his phone. Mm -hmm. Or like, and, and man, he loves me. Or I could say, my dad was just sitting there, not checking his phone, probably wanted to, and I wasted his time. You know, right? So how much of, of when you're settling your mind, are you also choosing the meaning, which I think, you know, like, we choose the meaning to most of our experiences. Yeah, I have a, yeah, so it's a really... So yeah, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, it's a really interesting point, right? And, you know, Sam Harris actually does some stuff around this. You Partly what you're pointing to is some of the practices around positivity psychology, right? Um, I don't know that meditation alone is the 
is the is Got the it. path that will kind of solve the problem you're pointing to, which is yep. uh, in humans, we have this thing called the negativity bias. And it's a it's an evolutionary mechanism that allows us to survive. We are such highly social creatures that we're constantly scanning for threat in our relationships, in the world. We There's research that they've said like... Um, Nine out of 10 thoughts are negative thoughts. They're about like doomsday, what could be mm. happening. This is this is what has kept us alive as a species. Um, Got it. And so there's something we have to overcome in that. And meditation helps us slow down our thoughts so that we're not, to your point, like immediately jumping to meaning making. It slows it down enough where we don't have to believe mm. every thought that comes across our our mind, right? That's That's where it's helpful. But I think there's actually some deeper work that's more, you know, that's like kind of on the mental level. Then there's the emotional level. And when we mm-hmm. have unresolved feelings and resentments that are hung up in our body mind, then that that leads to us making assumptions and turning towards negative thoughts and feelings. And often that means there's something unresolved in us that needs to expressing and feeling. And so when I when mm-hmm. I work with people that are kind of in a depressed state or stuck in negative loops, of course, I'm going to teach the meditation, but I'm also going to do more emotional based work around exploring what is the source of this negative negativity? What is unresolved from your past? What are you hanging on to here that needs to uh, that's unfelt that needs to be felt or expressed? And for me, that's actually a a, a more effective way at shifting negativity. Um, The meditation definitely won't hurt. But there's this whole concept of like spiritual bypassing, where if we just like meditate enough, we will never feel anger or resentment and negativity. And it's just not true. It's it's not yeah. true. It, it helps, but it's not a magic bullet in that way. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Love it. All right. Couple couple questions for you. Um, in your opinion, what is the role of the father? Hmm, I love this question. You know, I think you've heard a little bit from me like... Um, you know, we can kind of make it what what is needed in the moment. And for me, it's yeah. like sometimes I'm fathering and mothering. Um, but when I lean, f- if I lean into the masculine part of my parenting, um, there is obviously the safety and security piece, the providership piece, the the setting my kids up for, you know, leaving a mark in the world. But the more interesting thing for me about being a father, my role is to snap them out of their everyday myopic self-centered reality is to take Mm -hmm. them and pull them out and show them different parts of the world, different new ways of thinking, new ways of being, show them art and culture and nature and take them into, you know, edgy, uncomfortable situations so that they're learning something new about themselves. And for me, that is it. It's, It's the adventure that I provide them and the you know, blowing their minds as often as I can, exposing them to new ways of being so that they're a more well-rounded human and not just stuck in their ruts. I think that's part of what fatherhood can be is, is mm. you know, there's this, um, there's this idea that like the mother, um, this guy that I work with, John Wineland, he talks about this, like the mother's role. And of course, this is all changing right around roles. But in the traditional sense, the mother's role is about cultivating the connection to the self in the child and the father's role is about cultivating the connection to the world. Right. And fundamentally that there's something about that, that really feels right for me. Yeah. Interesting. Cause it also, the, the father seems to really affirm their identity, but maybe that is their identity out in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, how do I show up in the world as me comfortable in my skin? So, yeah. Okay. I dig it. Now, a question that I'm starting to ask is, and actually before I ask this, you said, uh, creating some uncomfortable situations. What's an example of a way you could create or put your kids into like an adventure position at 10 and 12 years old? Yeah. Um, well, the big thing is, like I said, like, you know, when I ask my son, what's the one thing you need from me this year mm. so that you feel that you feel like you're getting what you need from me and you feel connected to me? And his answer several years in a row has been, I need a backpacking trip with you in the summer. I need a week mm. off the grid with it's just you and me in the middle of the wild. And not everybody's going to have that same desire, but I think he's pointing to something that is, um, you know, that getting your kids 
and getting them out in nature and away from phones so you can have those deeper conversations, really look each other in the eyes and let nature do its thing around nourishment and awe and wonderment, even if it's just simply car camping. Um, but that we're, we're dropping the devices and we're getting back to you know our connection to the magic and the wonderment and the awe of this grand planet, looking at the stars at night, that kind of stuff, I think really um, is impactful. And it's also, if you, you know, when I bring this up with, you know, men, often they'll say, oh, that's actually the thing I remember the most about my father is like, he would always take Mm -hmm. us on these camping trips or he'd take us to these beautiful parks, right? It's, you're instilling memories and it's not just the like taking the photo of the beautiful spot. There's something about the presence of our parents in those moments that um, is deeply satisfying and nourishing for our for our youngins. Love it. Uh, so this next question about the the role of the father, and and if you can look in the future a little bit, I'd like men to start thinking more about one day I I, I most likely will be a grandfather, and the work I do today is going to impact that man down the road. What do you, I guess, let me ask like this. What type of grandfather do you want to be? Hmm. <laughs> um, great question. I, I want to be, I have this, had this vision in my mind for many years that I'm like sitting under a tree and on a chair, maybe enjoying some fruit. And the kids come to me for, to be seen in a deeper way, right? Like they come hmm. to be recognized and honor and celebrated and, that I see something in them that maybe nobody else sees or I see it in a way where they help, it really helps them understand who they are and where they come from. And I see the best in them and see what's possible. And then I evoke the best version of themselves through my, you know, my um, presence and my reflection to them. Um, That's who I want to be. Man, okay, check it out. So as I, as you paint the picture for me, what I see is that you, you, you said that they want to be seen by you. And for you to be able to do that, you are not so focused inwardly on yourself. And I think that there's this freaking concept of, I put my 40 years in, I'm going to retire at 65 and I'm going to be a selfish son of a bitch now and golf and do what I want and don't bring the grandkids over. And this is annoying. I need my foot, my games on, shut those kids up, blah, blah, blah. Like there's this 40 years of building to this entitlement moment of now I'm supposed to be able to enjoy the work that I did, which is just a bunch of horse shit. And I hope that everyone listening feels that I feel that way. Because if I'm at 65 plus or whatever, you find freedom from having to work to hopefully getting to do things that you want to do. Hopefully you're doing that now. To be in such a place to sit under a tree, enjoying some fruit, and to to see those that are in your care. Um, because that's what we want. We want to belong. We want to be seen. We want to be known. And so I I love what you said because I want us men right now to not be thinking about golfing whenever we want, golf if you want to golf, whatever, but to be thinking about the impact we can have as a grandfather, right? You're still a father. It's just in a different sense. So what comes up for you when I share my uh, somewhat passionate view? Uh, I love it. I love it. I, I share it, man. And the thing that comes to mind actually is there's this idea that, you know, there's so much burden on men in the, in the masculine, right? Mm. There is, we, we are in a constant state of weight on our shoulders to provide, to protect, mm. to, you know, that weight that I think we all can feel, right? That our families need us. There's mouths to feed. There's people that need us. And if we let that burden eat away at us, I think that's what you get. The other version that you described, which is, don't yeah. bother me. Get off my lawn. I'm going to play golf. Yeah. I'm not available. Yeah. Right. It's that is a that is a man that has never dealt with the burden of being a man. He is not doing the things mm. that you and I are describing, which is like, this is why I walk in the forest several times a week by myself with mm-hmm. no one around for 30 to 60 minutes so that I relieve myself of that burden. I put myself in a place where there it's a, a space of no demand right? Where no one Mm. needs anything from me for some period of time. 
I am not available. My, if you call my phone, you're not going to get me. And uh, it allows me to not to, to metabolize and let go of that burden that uh, for most men builds up over decades to the point where they can't actually appreciate um, the presence of their grandchildren or their loved ones or their Oof. partner, right? Um, yeah. When we are so full of burden, it corrodes at our very ability to mm. receive and give love. Man, I think that's the best example of the the walk in the forest meditation that I've ever heard is to go release that burden. And now the reason why is to create space of no demand. And if I can create that space of no demand, then I'm not just going to carry it and be this bitter old man. Like what a missed opportunity, man, because you did all that work to now have all this knowledge, time and space if you live through it. Right. So like, did you live through it or did you just like carry the weight and bitch and complain? Uh, dude, this is freaking gold. Okay. Uh, second to last question. And it is the mantra behind my fatherhood field notes podcast is rebel and create. And as men, we're warriors. We, you know, we've we used that terminology in this podcast, but, but we're also creators. So what's something that you are rebelling against and what do you hope to create out of that rebellion? Yeah, I'm rebelling against a culture of disconnection uh, and isolation. Um, it has to end. The the screen addicted, the uh, lack of depth in our relationships, it is eroding the very essence of our communities. And I am creating a culture of reintroducing healthy masculinity in through rites of passage and initiation so that we have true masculine leadership in our lives and in our culture um, that is enabling deep connection and deep, uh, deep community. Mm. Connection and community. So critical, so important. All right, my friend, this, this has been incredible. Last question is a legacy question. Imagine 30 years from now. So 30 years from now, you are going to be the father to a, you know, 40 year old and a 42 year old. Mm. Okay. They're going to be very similar to where you're sitting at right now in your timeline of life. If you were to peer into the homes of your children, what is it that you would hope to see being played out, which would put a big old fat smile on your face, knowing I showed up, mm. I showed up and I passed on some of me to them. Yeah. I love it. I, I have this picture of just like a, radical, freely expressed humans that are like, you know, kind of unapologetic in who they are, tons of art around their homes and, mm. and just like a, a sense of warmth and connection. And that, um, there's just, their hearts are free to really feel, uh, beauty and wonderment and awe and love the, that their loved ones, they feel, you know, that they're able to be in some really deep, meaningful exchange with them and that they're doing good work in the world. They're leaders. I think <laughs> it's so clear our world needs good heart centered leaders mm. uh, right now. And so that they're making contributions and leaving their own impact in whatever way that is through their art or business or whatever it happens to be. Um, but it, I just see a lot of colors in that. Like, there's a vibrant, like there's, mm. they're sucking the marrow out of life. They're, they're tasting all the fruits. Man, you know, one, the one thing that you said, it was just simple, but that you see art on the wall. And I love that because they're taking the time to enjoy what some would call the little things, mm -hmm. right? Like it's so easy to make work and, and these have tos and these shoulds is important to where taking a piece of art, something that I choose to pause and enjoy and taking the hammer and the nail or whatever and getting it on the wall and, and pausing and enjoying it. It, a lot of us are missing that. We're missing the sunsets. We're missing the sunrise and we're, we're missing it because we're so busy, 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 busy. And so just that one word, the sentence statement, I want to see art hung up. It means that one, an apologetic, right? They've, I like this, right? Like I have this art on my wall right now. Yeah. You might not like it. This means something to me. Yeah. I like it. When I look at it, it reminds me of so much. And if I pause enough and look at this, this piece that my friend painted for me, it does something for me. And so I just think that those little statements we make are great to sit on because there's so much depth just to what that 
what, what you meant in that. So yeah. any last thoughts, my friend, before, before we, we head back out into the world? No, I just, I love what you're up to. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, if folks are interested in the rites of passage program, they can, they can get that over at fathersonconnection.com. That's again for the 10 to 14 year olds and their dads. So you can find me there. You can find me on Instagram. I have my own podcast, Crazy Wisdom. We, we cover some of these similar topics. Um, yeah, but uh, mostly just thanks for having me on. Yeah, love it. Okay, so podcast, we'll have that in the show notes. Uh, the rites of passage in the show notes, you have an event coming up uh, in 2024. You have a few, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, yep, Dude, thank you for your time. Thank you for the man you are. Thank you for continuing to show up every day. And I appreciate you sharing your life with me. Thank you. Until next time. What an incredible conversation. I so enjoyed connecting with Luke. I love the way that the conversation flowed. Uh, I really loved the idea of not outsourcing your parenting, right? I mean, this came from a situation that Luke is in uh, of, you know, being full-time parent, everything for half the time. But what a beautiful aha for you and I to get to experience asking ourselves the question, is there areas I'm outsourcing because maybe my spouse and I are operating this together. The other thing I really just want to bring up is, is the grandfather. Am I moving towards thinking about the influence, there though goes that word again, influence that I have the potential of having when I am a grandfather versus a selfishness that could potentially come because I haven't unloaded my burdens at this season of life where there just may be a lot that you're carrying. Now, my friends, we must know who we are. The world would look and feel different if men showed up in their identity to love, serve, guide, provide, and protect. Now, this is why I launched Adventure of Fatherhood. Check it out, adventureoffatherhood.com. I've launched three online courses, uh, one intro to fatherhood for new dads. If you're a dad with a five-year-old or a 15-year-old and you're struggling with how to show up, it's just all go up, sign up. You can just take the course on your own, but that's Discover Fatherhood. Once you make it through one of those two courses, which is about a 30 30 days, then there is a 90-day intentional fatherhood course. Next one is uh, starting pretty soon. And that is called the 18-Year Roadmap. Now, if you are enjoying this podcast, please take a minute, write a review. It helps spread the word that fatherhood matters. Thank you to you dads out there listening to Fatherhood Field Notes podcast, What You Do Matters. Don't be like everybody else. Be yourself. That is who your kids, spouse, and community needs. This is your guide, Ned. Shout together. Let's rebel against the view that fatherhood has little impact and create lives engaged in mastering the craft of fatherhood. I look forward to hanging out with you next time.